Morning, everyone. It's a very quiet day on the Hill. <laughs> Once again, the Republicans have shown their true colors. They simply cannot help themselves. Americans all across the country woke up to news that the Trump Justice Department is once again launching an assault on health care in the United States of America. The Republicans want to take away health care from tens of millions of Americans again. The Republicans want to impose what would be effectively an age tax on Americans between 50 and 64, forcing a dramatic increase in premiums, co-pays, and deductibles. Once again, the Republicans want to strip away protection for Americans with pre-existing conditions. They simply cannot help themselves. This was the defining issue of the 2018 midterm elections. We embrace this fight because House Democrats were given the majority in order to defend health care on behalf of everyday Americans, and that is exactly what we are doing. Later on this afternoon, Chairman Frank Pallone, Chairman Bobby Scott, as well as other members of the House Democratic Caucus, including Chairman Richie Neal, will be introducing legislation to strengthen the Affordable Care Act. That legislation will protect Americans with pre-existing conditions. Our legislation will expand access to health care coverage. While at the same time, the Trump Justice Department files reckless legal papers to try and destroy health care for tens of millions of Americans. You can't make this up. And so there's a clear contrast in terms of what we as House Democrats are about and what Republicans are about. Republicans fight for the wealthy, the well-off, and the well-connected. Democrats fight for working families, middle-class folks, senior citizens, the poor, the sick, and the afflicted, period, full stop. That's the contrast, and it's going to play itself out in front of the American people. Now, we were very clear on what we as House Democrats were going to focus on were we given the majority by the American people. We promised that we were going to fight for the people. We promised we were going to fight for lower health care costs. We promised we were going to fight for bigger paychecks and a real infrastructure plan. We promised that we were going to clean up corruption and bring our democracy to life as we, as we have begun to do with passage of H.R. 1. Promises made, promises kept. And in connection with our fight for bigger paychecks for all Americans, let me now uh, yield to the distinguished vice chair of the House Democratic Caucus, my friend from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Catherine Clark. Thank you, Hakeem, and good morning. It's a historic week and a busy week here in Washington because this week the House is standing up for people. It's standing up for equality because on Wednesday we are going to vote on the Paycheck Fairness Act. Uh, this will guarantee equal pay for equal work, fulfilling part of our For the People agenda that we are going to look to increase paychecks. We all know the statistics. Women who work full-time year-round are paid on average 80 cents for every dollar paid to men for the same work, and those statistics get worse for women of color. The Paycheck Fairness Act is going to help close this gap by taking multiple steps. 
Protecting against retaliation for discussing salaries, prohibiting employers from screening job applicants based on salary history, providing legal protections to people who file discrimination complaints, and creating a negotiation skills training program. Because with equality comes economic opportunity. And by passing this bill, we are putting the nearly $500,000 that women lose over the course of their careers to wage discrimination back in their pockets. That's $900 billion infused into our economy every single year, uplifting American families and going directly towards education, a home, or a retirement. We cannot say that we value women without enacting legal protections that prevent structural inequalities and without recognizing the vital role that women play in enriching our economy. So we are excited at this historic vote. It is the first time in almost 60 years that we are going to be stressing pay equality. It is part of the For the People agenda that Democrats promised and are delivering on. And with that, we'll open it to questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? We're not interested in who has the upper hand politically. We're interested in making sure that we protect the health care of the American people. We were sent to Washington to get that done. We should be able to do it in a bipartisan way. There are a whole host of issues that we as members of the House and the Senate are going to be called upon to address. Climate change is certainly one of them. This week, we're focused on lowering health care costs and increasing pay for everyday Americans and making sure that there is equal pay for equal work. We didn't run on impeachment. We didn't win the House of Representatives on impeachment. We're not focused on impeachment. What is clear is that the overwhelming majority of the House Democratic Caucus want to drive our For the People agenda, which is why we're going to vote out of the House of Representatives this week the Paycheck Fairness Act, introduce legislation to strengthen the Affordable Care Act, continue to work on lowering the high cost of life-saving prescription drugs, and at some point enact a real infrastructure plan, not the fake one that Donald Trump introduced. We'll see what happens uh, in terms of the vote today. Certainly, everyone that cares about the United States Constitution, uh, as many of my Republican colleagues profess to do, uh, should be alarmed at this presidential overreach. This is not a dictatorship. It's a democracy. Congress is a separate and co-equal branch of government. Pursuant to Article I of the Constitution, uh, we have the power of the purse, and that prerogative has been invaded by Donald Trump. And that's why we're hopeful that we can override this veto in a bipartisan fashion. Well, I'm going to leave that decision to uh, Chairman John Yarmuth. He's in discussions right now with members of the Budget Committee leadership as well as the House Democratic Caucus. We want to figure out how we can move forward and find common ground. But here's what we're not going to do. We are not going to allow the president uh, to move a budget forward that cuts $2 trillion out of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. That's unconscionable. Yeah, I would just like to uh, underscore what the chairman just said. That is, we in Appropriations Committee are looking at the budget that the president just set. 
we see devastation to those economic issues to families at home, starting with going back on the promise the president made repeatedly in his campaign that it was hands off. We would not touch Medicare, Social Security, or Medicaid. And at the same time that he professes that, we see $2 trillion in cuts. And very particularly, my discussion with Secretary Azar was about the impact of that on the opioid crisis. Because we know Medicaid is how most people in this country access treatment for addiction. So if this president is serious about that, if he is serious about investing and helping us combat the opiate crisis, it is the completely wrong place to start by narrowing in on uh, uh, you know, Medicaid expansion states and, and making that less available when we know that has tripled access to uh, recovery treatment for people who use Medicaid. Uh, states that have expanded have seen startling results in the right direction. This president wants to not only go back on his promises around Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, but it will have a particular impact on the ability uh, to combat this opioid crisis that is so devastating to constituents in my district and across this country. Cheryl. Well, at this point, the ball is in the court of the Attorney General. Uh, six committee chairs have sent a letter requesting that the Mueller report uh, be released to the public, as well as the underlying documentation, no later than Tuesday, April 2nd. So how much energy have Democrats needed to convince Joe to spend on pushing <coughs> Well, I think as evidenced by the opening remarks that I delivered and as evidenced by the opening remarks that Vice Chair Clark delivered, we're going to continue to focus on the issues that are of importance to the American people. House Democrats are focused on kitchen table pocketbook issues involving lower health care costs and increased pay for everyday Americans. We were very clear when we had our closing conversation with the American people about what exactly we would focus on in connection with our For the People agenda. Nowhere in the For the People agenda does it talk about Russia. Nowhere in the For the People agenda does it talk about collusion. Nowhere in the For the People agenda does it talk about obstruction of justice. The For the People agenda is about lowering health care costs for the American people, strengthening the Affordable Care Act, protecting people with pre-existing conditions, increased pay, and a real infrastructure plan that's what House Democrats are focused on today, tomorrow, and for the rest of this congressional session. Vice Chair, that sounds like a shift. I mean, people told you about the House Republicans' message of what does Donald Trump have, uh, what does Hillary Clinton have on Trump financially, what's what the tax returns. It looks like Chairman Wheeler teed up and ready to go with this formal request. So, I mean, when you talk about issues of importance, isn't uh, the president's promise to tax the Russia? The first, and I'm going to yield to Vice Chair Clark, the first hearing that Elijah Cummings had this year was on lowering the high cost of life-saving prescription drugs. The first hearing that Chairman Frank Pallone had this year was on strengthening the Affordable Care Act. The first hearing that Chairman Richie Neal had this year was on protecting people with pre-existing conditions. In fact, Nancy Pelosi, several weeks ago, was very clear, indicating she ain't interested in this impeachment thing. And did House Democrats agree with her or disagree? House Democrats agreed with her perspective. That was before <coughs> we knew what was or was not in the Mueller investigation. So we've been entirely consistent. Oh, sorry, Catherine Clark. I, 
I just want the word you use shift. Um, there is a shift. There is a shift from the Republican majority that focused on the very wealthiest Americans and large corporations and making sure that they were doing okay. That was the emphasis of the tax bill that passed last year. That's the emphasis of their economic policies. And that is the shift that you have seen with Democrats in the majority. We are focused on putting those issues that American families care about and talk about around their kitchen tables back on the front burner in Congress. And at the same time, we are going to live up to our Article I responsibilities of oversight, which the Republicans absolutely failed to do. So there is a shift. There's a shift to returning power to the American voters. There is a shift to concentrating on those issues that matter to their families and matter to their economics at home. That's the shift that's happening. That is a shift that we are unwavering from. No. So over the last two years, there was a lot of emphasis by some on the Russian investigation, its implications. In many cases, that's all you would see on certain outlets. But we, as House Democrats, focused on protecting people with pre-existing conditions lowering health care costs, and our candidates all across the country were talking about kitchen table, bread and butter, pocketbook issues, while some in this town were obsessed with the Russian investigation. Now, based on that precedent, you would expect there was no way we were going to be able to break through in district after district after district and win control of the House of Representatives but we won control of the House of Representatives, not focused on Russia, not focused on collusion, not focused on impeachment, not focused on obstruction of justice, but focused on health care and on infrastructure and on cleaning up corruption in Washington, D.C. That is why we're focused on those issues now that we're in the majority. I just would like to add that it took this administration one day, uh, one work day, to flip back to their true agenda and one of their true priorities, which is taking away health care for millions of Americans. One day it took them to get back on their message of what they're truly trying to do to American families. Back. And Uh, we have not heard back, as far as I understand it. Uh, I assume that that response will be directed to the six committee chairs who authored the letter. Uh, we'll see what occurs. We're all hopeful uh, that consistent with the overwhelming public sentiment of the American people, the full and complete Mueller report will be released by uh, April 2nd. The House voted 420 to zero to publicly disclose the Mueller report. The president has said repeatedly the Mueller report should be disclosed. The overwhelming majority of the American people, including majorities of Republicans, Democrats, and independents, have said the Mueller report should be disclosed. We expect that the Attorney General will disclose it no later than April 2nd. I think the first step, as Jerry Nadler has indicated, is to receive the report and then we'll proceed thereafter with the possibility of testimony from the Attorney General, from the Deputy Attorney General, or others who may be relevant, consistent with our oversight responsibilities. Go to the back.
We're focused right now on seeing what happens on the floor, and then collectively the leadership will decide how we proceed from there. Well, Lindsey Graham spent years as the sidekick to John McCain. And then Donald Trump gets elected, and Donald Trump continues to bash John McCain in reprehensible ways, and Lindsey Graham on the issue is in the witness protection program. So he should resolve that issue uh, before he wants to lecture Democrats on our responsibility as a separate and co-equal branch of government in the House. And I would just like to add to that, I would say to Lindsey Graham, 37 indictments, 37 indictments coming out of this investigation. Uh, I think that he should proceed with caution if he really wants to examine this entire investigation again and put his, uh, his president that he defends uh, through thick or thin um, back in the spotlight with his involvement. Uh, it's part of the reason that we need to see this full report to understand the evidence that went into this. But when this investigation yielded 37 indictments, many of those, uh, at least six or seven of those, the closest advisors to this president, uh, we welcome that scrutiny. Let me also just add, 17 different intelligence agencies concluded that Russia interfered with the election and attacked our democracy as part of an effort to try and artificially place Donald Trump at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. These 17 different intelligence agencies aren't filled with <coughs> warm and fuzzy liberals. These are national security types dedicated to the safety and well-being of the American people. Every single major player connected to the Mueller investigation, as far as I can tell, is a Republican. James Comey is a Republican. The current FBI director, Christopher Wray, who presided over the investigation on the FBI side is a Republican. Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General who appointed the special counsel, is a Republican. Bob Mueller, who presided over the investigation into Russia's interference with the election, is a Republican. Was this a vast right-wing Republican conspiracy? That perhaps is the question that Lindsey Graham should spend his time addressing. Last question. It is a reasonable thing to make sure that if there are sources and methods that could potentially be disclosed in the Mueller report, that those are redacted in the interest of national security. With respect to potential grand jury testimony, the standard has traditionally been that the presumption of secrecy can be overcome if there is a compelling public interest. In this case, with Russia's attack on our democracy, and the potential cooperation with members of the Trump campaign having been the subject of the investigation, there was certainly a compelling national interest. Thank you.